Um, this just point of interest is I've got the seed pod. Um, seed is tiny. Yeah, there's probably about three or four thousand in there. Tiny little stuff, just like dust. But that's what we do here. We're breeding new plants. So just to give you an example of what we do. Um, this is a species. This is Tracy Anum. Um, this is a sort of Indochina, sort of into the Himalayas, I suppose, really. A lot of these sort of things come from. Now, just to show you the line of the breeding, this plant was bred in the 1960s. So you can see it's not that much bigger, but it's obviously cleaning the colour out. You can still see the stripe in there. Then the next plant that comes along, the next lot of breeding, this is bred sort of early 90s, I suppose, something like that. 80s, no, a bit early, maybe 80s. Then the next generation goes up to here, which is 2002. And then we've got another lineup, which is even bigger um, and rounder. And we tend to, to, all humans like this, we like big, round, symmetrical flowers. So we basically go up and up and up and round and round and round. But as you can see, we clean the colour out all the way through there. They get cleaner and cleaner each generation. Um, unfortunately, we got a bit too far, so we went it like a bucket on a stick, really. They look a bit, a bit cabbagey, really. We've ended up with the gladioli. So, um, and a lot of people prefer a much more open flower. Fair enough, if you want to win awards, if you're a bit of an orchid freaky, then you've got to go for a big roundy flower. But if you want a pot plant, people have been asking for the old fashioned varieties. So here at Mabees, we made another cross, slightly different ones. I'll show you here. So this is another species. So this is Erythraeum. Um, this is actually one I made. I crossed two erythraeums together to give us this beautiful little plant. And look how thin the leaf is compared with the, the previous ones. Let me just show the difference there. You see, it's a sort of a quarter of the size uh, mm. of the leaves. So the idea is to make a much finer, old-fashioned, starry flower, much more user-friendly as a pot plant. So the first generation there was to make that plant itself. So that's the species that I made it. Then the next is the plant behind it. Now that's the plant of uh, Princess Charlotte. Um, that's just starting to go over now, but that's been open now for three months. Um, okay, so I'm a nursery, so it's quite cool. We run a night temperature of eight degrees and a day of about 15 degrees. In those temperatures, they really, really last. And we've actually made another cross after that as well to, to bring the size down a bit. But each generation is a minimum of six years work. From making the cross to see it flower, we have to allow six years. So that group there is at least, what, eight, probably 24 years work, just to get that. And obviously you don't do it in one group, you, you, you flower a nice big batch and then you breed with the ones you want to do. So that's what we do basically. So that's our starting point. Um, this particular plant here, this is a famous plant, this is Loeana magnificum McBeans. Um, now this plant has been on the nursery for 120 years this year, um, and it's been to every single Chelsea flower show. So that's quite a famous little plant. Anyway, let's move on a little bit. Now, in the mid-80s, some of the artificially um, created plants by that, this is a man-made tetraploid. Most plants, most things in life are diploid. But this is a man-made tetraploid. It was um, attacked with a chemical um, that gives it, ends up with double the amount of chromosomes. So you get this really bigger, rounder, blobbier flower but the colour's much more intense and much, much nicer flowers. So what we did, we added that to all of them at Beanstalk. So we get all these things through here have all got the red beauty in the background. So here we've got um, Loch Allegria when we were going for the sort of the creamy look. Um, and this one here is uh, Loch Marie. Um, now they've been a famous, famous plant. They come a bit darker than that. In fact, the plant in the front here is actually crossed between the two. So there's Loch Allegria with Loch Marie. Um, so you get a whole range of colours all the way from the back of all these colours. So by adding that particular plant to all our existing stock, um, we've got these beautiful, beautiful cut flowers, or big pot plant flowers, whichever way you want to look at it. A lot of them have that big red lip from the original plant. Um, so that's again, is another lot Marie at the back there. So we just keep on going breeding, to be honest. Um, they're just getting a bit too big as well. For a pot plant, they're getting too tall. So the idea is to reduce the size down. So there's another one, you can see the lot, um, that's another lot Marie. And then we've gone over to things like this, which is a PG Woodhouse. And again, look at that lip, it's absolutely stunning. Um, so these are sort of the end of the early, it's getting into the mid season. So there's a group here, these are a lot of Monteith. Um, again, they've got the red beauty in them, but way back. So we've gone another few generations on there. And the lip on that is absolutely fabulous. You can't beat that at all. Um, this is Brickyards. 
Obviously, they're mostly going to be reds and pinks when we're breeding with that, but we do other colours. So, the, see the yellow at the back there? That's a completely separate line of breeding. So, we do a whole range of colours, obviously, but cymbidiums come in lots and lots of colours. Um, so, here's one of the big, see that beautiful colour there? Let's see what the heck it is. One of the Loch Levins. So, it's a sort of almost a honey colour, really. Um, we still have a few miniatures where we reduce the size right down. Apart from my um, Erythraean breeding, we've got these miniatures. This is a really old one. This is Minette's beautiful old Cymbidium. Again, the thinking was there to make a pot plant out of all the, the Cymbidium range. This is um, Latigo, and we've got a whole bench of these where we've cloned them. We've actually taken a single cell uh, and we produced the cell up by, I think we did about 5,000 of them. We've still got one bench left, I think. So this is a sister plant to the Princess Charlotte. This is uh, Prince George. Again, it's an erythraeum, so you get that nice thin leaf. Um, and it makes such a difference. We're aiming for a pot plant, so we don't want to think too tall. Um, but unfortunately, some of the, um, the uh, Charlotte's got a bit too big. But a big classic cymbidium like these um, they can take up a lot of room, but you see that's a good, what, five, six? We do have a few cymbidiums actually, and nearly as touching a seven inch flower, but they're getting too big. Um, they're losing all their charm in effect. Here we've got a group of pink charlottes. Now, and they, tend to, they came in three colour groups, basically. They're all seedlings, so everyone is different. There's a pink lot, there's a red lot, and then there's a sort of a terracotta batch. Um, but these are absolutely stunning. They really are a really beautiful little plot plant. And these could easily fit into a, a period drama. You know, they go for Sherlock Holmes or Poirot or something like that because they're of that time. So what I've really done is remade a cross um, as it would be in the 1920s. But our plants grow now much quicker, much easier, and have a lot more flowers. We've had some Charlottes with five flower spikes and a two-litre pot, literally only been on the nursery for four years. So they grow very, very quickly, but they, and they flower for, as I said, three months in our conditions, which say our cool growing is pretty good. Um, we have some albinos. These were bred originally from some um, Australian plants. They grow a lot of albinos out there. Um, and all we've done is just altered them to fit our grouping. So we don't want them too big, too, too tall. They're gonna be a nice compact plant. Um, it's got a slight perfume on them, to be honest. Yeah. This is Big Tracy. Um, she had 690 flowers on this uh, November. Year before, 770. So we think we're going to point, we're going to have to pot her soon, but she takes up so much room as you can see. <laughs> it's just an absolute mass of flowers. Right, we're going back now to the Erythraean breeding. This is Prince Louis. Yes. So basically, this is the Erythraean onto the green. So we're just going for a completely different colour line there. Um, they are a bit bigger than the other two, than the Charlottes and the Georges, but they've got this really old-fashioned look again, which has brought so many people back into the orchid world. Um, people don't tend to... So if you're, if you're an, an orchid fan or you want to win prizes, then you go for the big, round, blobby things, but these are so delicate. I mean, these are a gorgeous-looking flower, absolutely amazing thing. And again, they grow very easily. The Louis has less flower spikes on the other two, but still quite amazing. This is Loch Tay. This is bred from a famous McBean group of plants from Loch Lomond, Loch Lomond J.B. Russon. Um, this is probably, doesn't look that much different than Loch Lomond. In fact, it's probably a little bit lighter, but it, again, it flowers easier and flowers much, much quicker. Um, I think this probably plant, this is 883. So this came around in about the 1970s, this was bred. Um, and this for me is quite a nice flower. You've got this gap between the sepals and the petals. Um, in fact, that's the easiest identity of an orchid, is the, is the flower structure. We have a sepal there, then two petals, then two more sepals there, and the lip is, in fact, reformed petals. And every orchid follows that. But I say we've overgrown it so that this can sometimes mask the petals, which is pointless having it. If you can't see it, mm. it's been overgrown. Um, here's, again, one of the great big lock levens. Um, beautiful classic. Um, that's actually one of the PG Woodhouse. Um, I think that might even be Bertie Wooster. Um, but again, it's not quite opened up yet, but again, it's got that nice definition between the sepal and the petal. Um, again, there's some more um, 
Princess Charlotte's there, but you can see gone down that sort of more mahogany, mm. rusty colour. Right, let's just quickly back out into one of the last houses. We've got a lot of this stuff around the place. This is the Spanish moss. Um, it just grows at about 30% per year. We have to wash, water it down once or twice a day in the summer, but again with rainwater. It has beautiful flowers, bright, bright green flowers in about May time. It's stunning. But we just use it really for um, hiding pots and things if we do a display at Chelsea or somewhere like that, we might do a jungle scene, we just put the moss around the pot basically. So again we've got a selection here, more of the Charlottes. Um, these are again diploids. I mentioned before that, that plant had extra chromosomes on. Now we've got two Charlottes that are flowered naturally but with twice as many chromosomes. Let me just show you here. So there's one, there's two. So these are exactly the same as all the other Princess Charlottes but they've got twice as many chromosomes. And you can see um, it's really made the colour intensify and it's a much, much thicker flower, much stronger. The only downside of it is we only get one flower spike per plant. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to, we could then continue a tetraploid breeding of that. But it's pointless because we're trying to make a starry old fashioned flower. So the last thing we need to do is to modernise that. I want to keep it as an old fashioned flower. This is a beautiful plant. This is Musita Ophum. This is one of my favourite cymbidiums. Um, absolutely stunning little things. Gorgeous lips on them. Um, the plants behind us, these are uh, gold runs um, cross with one of our big yellows. And again, it's been bred to be not too tall, not too big a flower. You can argue that it's getting a little bit cabbagey now, but again, it hasn't quite finished opened up. But a nice, clean, bright, cheery flower is what we're after. Um, that flowers in cool conditions. Um, there's another albino there, Liz Johnson, which has got the most amazing lip on there. I don't know if you can see that lip, but it's really sort of a daffodil yellow lip. Absolutely stunning, really gorgeous. Um, the oranges, these are an old plant. These were bred in the 70s. Um, these are from our old Angelica, Angelica cross Lilianas. And again, it's a lovely starry flower. That to me is absolutely gorgeous, stunning, but a bit you know, it's, you go one way or the other. Mm. It's more albinos. These are some in between. So these aren't a true miniature and they're not a true standard in effect. They're sort of in between the size. Um, but again, it, it fits that pot plant thing, basically. Um, some white albinos, nice clear albinos. Um, again, I've been breeding a few lines of these. Then we've got Lock of Monteith. This is actually Lock of Monteith variety, I can tell you here. Cooksbridge. Mm. Um, so we've got about eight of these, <clears throat> or Lock of Monteith that is, and they're all named after different villages around here, uh, Cooksbridge being our nearest one. But it's an outstanding flower. Again, it's got this amazing lip. You can see the, the chevrons, the lines going down the inside of the lip yeah. to aid the insects of pollination. This is a big old thing. This is pink ice. Um, real old cabbagey flower, it's an amazing thing though. This used to flower for Chelsea every year, but through global warming it flowers much easier. I said we're literally at the beginning of February now, so they're much, much earlier. And then last but not least, and I think we've got a, another bit of one of the Loch Levins. Um, again, it's a sort of a bit of a muddy colour, but you don't want all clean colours, you've got to mix things around a bit. What we've got here is Christmas Joy. This is Christmas Joy, Lewis Cheer, which again is quite a magnificent flower, as you can see. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have a laboratory any longer at the nursery, so we still do some seed work, but we'll send it away to be done. Um, so we'll only do small batches. Before mm. we had, we were three times the size, so we had a great big area, so we could flower great big batches of seedlings and then keep the best for breeding. So now we'll have to tailor it all down a bit and just do smaller batches. So we'll still do some breeding work, but it'll be a lot less work than we, than we used to do. Um, I said it's only February in here, so it's, it's quite nice today because the sun's out, but we've had a very, very dull winter. Um, but as soon as the sun's out really strong, then the screens will come over so it doesn't get very bright. But this house will be finny flower in another couple of months' time, literally by April, and um, we we'll really will have finished. Um, apart from things like the lower onions we'll keep for Chelsea Flower Show. When I started here, it was quite easy. We used to have to fill up Chelsea with loads and loads of symbidians, you know, because Chelsea's at the end of well, mid to end of May, I suppose. But through global warming, everything's flowering at least a month earlier. 
Um, literally the other day we had 13 degrees. Well, 13 degrees in January was absolutely unheard of when I was a kid. So everything is flowering much earlier. So we have to have different plants at Chelsea, which is a shame really because a lot of people don't get to see our Cymbidium collection, which is quite impressive. I think, you know, they take up a lot of room, but they still look good. Right, let's walk down into the last house, which is actually um, a warmer growing house. Um, we have a lot of um, plants from around the world, but we sort of compromise with the temperature so we can grow the warmer ones, a fairly decent standard, and the cymbidiums grow ever so well, but we don't want to go over too quickly. So I can show you what we have in there. Well, you can immediately see some of the big dendrobiums are just coming into flower. Um, this is speciosum. Um, that's a great big brute that's been around for years. And all these little kingianums and things like that are all just bursting into flower now. It's spring as far as the plants are concerned. And then you can see there's just a whole raft, of, again, of more of the um, Charlottes, Princess Charlottes. Um, we've got a group of these things. These are bred from Devonianum. Um, and it gives you that sort of more of a pendulous spike and quite, again, a very rounded flower. Not grown so much commercially nowadays, but Devonian himself is lovely because it's a small compact pot um, and can have about five or six plants that really do hang down over the pot, yeah. but they won't flower for another month or two yet. Um, so we keep going through here. So again, these are more Charlottes. There's a few Erythraeums behind you. Then we've got this little batch of green. Well, the purpose of these is to grow a small pot plant, but with a larger flower. So we don't you know, the, the, the little um, Charlotte, you see the size of the flower. Well, what we're after is that size plant, but with the bigger flowers on. So here we've gone right the way back to crossing with a plant called Coriga tetra canary, in this case, which is the tetraploy version of canary. And we put this with, again with just a whole raft of our normal plants to give us this short um, pot plant that's, again, bright colours, should last for, well, at least a couple of months in flower, to be honest. And again, in our condition, even a bit longer. Um, so it's just another line of breeding. Um, again, we really want something that's not too tall, bright colours, flowers for a long time, and flowers for every year. Yeah. It could be the best orchid in the world, but if you only see it every five years, total waste of time. Yeah. But the Charlottes, to be honest, are the plants at the moment. They have reintroduced so many people to Cymbidiums, it's unbelievable. We ended up with thousands of them, for some reason, because they grow so well in the flowers, I think, and, and very high germination rate. We ended up with about 9,000 of these things. So this is the last batch lot to flower, in effect. Um, but they've been so, so good because, again, it's just this fine, simple plant that grows so well. All our symbiums, we suggest you put them in the garden from sort of mid-May right the way through till the frost. And, and down where we are, which is the south of England, uh, we don't get frost till probably about November time nowadays. Bring them in the house, but somewhere cool. Again, we could try and keep this cool 8, 10 degrees at night, no more than about 15 in the daytime. Um, don't forget them when they're outside, obviously chuck a bit of water and some feed on them, rainwater and feed that is, um, orchid feed. Um, and so just, just keep an eye on them, so sort of stand them on a brick so you don't get me too many wood lice sitting in the bottom of them. But when you bring them in the house it must be cool. If you bring that into your house in November and put it in your living room, that's summertime. And as they don't flower in summer, they'll abort their spikes, they actually drop their buds. So somewhere cool within the house, basically. Um, that's it, really. Obviously, as the season changes, we have different colours out. It's predominantly this sort of reds into sort of terracottas at the moment. But you can see some of the whites are coming through now as, as the season pokes on. Uh, and we will follow this on in about another six to eight weeks. We'll do a potting um, video for you to look at. Ellie here will do lots of potting for you, <laughs> division and potting on. Um, if you're not seeing it, refer to our October one, which came out, which was really potting on the oncidiums, the cool growing oncidiums, which we do in the autumn time, a little bit in the spring, but we won't touch any of these now really until mid-March mid is the perfect time for this. So they've then got the whole season to grow, root, re-establish before they hit their flowering period. Right, that's it really. That's our uh, view of milk beans in February. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, New. Bye-bye.